Hi, everybody. So in the last lecture, I talked about Franklin's no opportunity argument and explained how the argument works. In this, the second part of the lecture, I want to talk about possible, re possible replies to the no opportunity argument. And I want to focus on three replies because I think these are the most interesting ones. Let's start with the first reply, which is the only one that Franklin discusses. And that's what we might call the only abilities reply. So Franklin argues that to account for our practice of holding people morally accountable, we need three principles. The principle of wrongdoing, the principle of normative competence, and the principle of reasonable, reasonable opportunity. But this reply is based on the idea, so this reply claims that to account for our moral accountability practice, we only need these two principles. So we don't need the principle of reasonable opportunity. And so the upshot of this reply is that free will doesn't require what Franklin calls an opportunity. And this view is mainly associated with the philosophers Michael Ferrer and Kadri Vivalin. And these two philosophers motivate their view by analogy with dispositions. So objects are dispositional properties. These are properties that the objects have, but that only manifest under certain circumstances. For example, a flower pot is breakable, but it can have this property even if it never, in fact, if, even if it never breaks. It just means that it would break under certain circumstances. For example, if it's dropped to the floor. But an important fact about dispositions is that they can be masked. For example, if I wrap lots of styrofoam around, um, around the flower pot, then intuitively it's still breakable. It doesn't become unbreakable just because I wrap it in plastic or styrofoam or whatever. But now through the styrofoam, it would no longer break even if I throw it to the, throw it to the floor. So in this sense, the, dis the styrofoam masks the disposition. It makes it more difficult for the disposition to show itself or become active. And Ferrer and Vivalin argue that there are important analogies between abilities and dispositions. So one analogy between abilities and dispositions is that just like a breakable flower pot might never break, you can have an ability without ever using it. So for example, someone might have the ability to play the piano, but the person might never actually play the piano, but the person might still have the ability. And a second analogy is that abilities just like um, dispositions can be masked. So a flower pot is still breakable, even if it's wrapped in plastic, which makes it more difficult for the disposition to show itself. And similarly, a person, even if all pianos in the entire world were destroyed, people would still have the ability to play the piano, but it would now be more difficult for the ability to manifest, for the ability to show itself. And in particular, this last fact that abilities can be masked has inspired this account by Ferrer and Vivalin. So as I said earlier, Franklin argues that free will requires both ability and opportunity. So if you perform a morally bad action A, then according to Franklin, you only have free will and you only are more morally responsible for your action if it's both true that you had the ability to perform not A and the opportunity to perform not A. And having the opportunity to perform an action requires that there is no decisive obstacle. And Franklin spouses this out as there being no fact in place that doesn't depend on your action that is incompatible with you performing the action. But Ferrer and Vivalin deny that free will requires an opportunity in Franklin's sense. For them, you can be morally um, responsible for doing A, even if there was some, some obstacle that would have prevented you from doing not A. It only matters that you had the ability to do not A, even if that ability is masked in the sense that there's something that would make it very difficult and would, would prevent you from actually manifesting the ability. And here it might be worth to say a little bit about terminology. So it sounds very obscure. It sounds very implausible to say that you're morally responsible for A, even if you lack the opportunity to perform not A, or even if you, um, even if there was a decisive obstacle to you performing not A, but that's partly, of course, due to how Franklin Franklin defines these words. So he defines the word the word opportunity in a particular way, and that makes it that on Ferrer and Vivalin's account you lack the opportunity. 
But of course, Thera and, Viv Thera and Vivalin give their own definitions of what they mean by opportunity. And then it will turn out that you have the opportunity in their sense when you have free will. What's at issue here is only that Farrah and Vivalin deny that you need the opportunity in Franklin's sense, which they think is a too stringent way of understanding opportunities. And so why might you think that you are morally responsible for something or have the ability to do otherwise in the sense relevant for free will, even if there's some fact in place that would make it impossible for you to do not A? Well, when Franklin addresses this question, he thinks that a sense, an understanding of abilities and opportunities, as Franklin proposes, is implausibly strict or puts much too high demands on having an ability. According to Frere, it makes it absurdly difficult to have an ability. And in particular, he um, points out that if you understand abilities and opportunities the way Franklin does, then whenever you try to do something and you fail, it follows automatically that you didn't have the opportunity to do it. For example, suppose I try to walk across the room and then I stumble and fall on the floor. It then follows, according to, to Franklin, that I didn't have the ability and opportunity to walk across the room because there was some fact in place that prevented me from doing it. But Farah thinks it's just completely implausible that every time I fail at doing things, it automatically follows that I wasn't able to do things. According to Farah, it's a perfectly fine understanding of abilities and opportunities and having the ability to do something that you might be perfectly able to do something and also have the opportunity to do something, but still fail due to bad luck or there just being some obstacle in your place. And of course, the main upshot of having this more general, generous notion of ability and opportunity that Farrow presupposes is that once you no longer need the opportunity in Franklin's sense for free will, there's no longer any reason to think that free will is incompatible with determinism. Because remember, Franklin's argument was that if determinism is true and you in the actual world, you don't play the piano, then every world where you do play the piano, either the past or the laws of nature are different. And so there's some fact that needs to be different for you to play piano that doesn't depend on your actions, according to Franklin. But according to Farrow and Vivaline, you can have the ability to do something, even if doing, doing the fact presupposes changes to your circumstances that do not depend on your action. And so what's the problem with understanding, understanding abilities in the sense Vivaline and Farrow do, such that it doesn't require opportunities in Franklin's sense? So what's the problem with getting rid of Franklin's principle of reasonable opportunities? Well, Franklin's main objection to that move in the chapter is that if you have a theory of free will like Vivaline and Farrer, then it can no longer explain all cases where an agent is excused from moral accountability. And this main example is the case of an addict. So suppose you have an addict and that person has an irresistible desire to take a drug. And so instead of returning a book to the library, the person instead goes out and buys drugs. And Franklin thinks that this person, the addict, is not morally accountable because he stipulates that addictive desires are irresistible. So given that this person had an irresistible desire to take the drug, she's not morally accountable for not returning the library book. And so the question is, Suppose we think that the, the addict is not morally accountable. What explains why he's not morally accountable? And Franklin thinks that the two principle theory that is only the principle of wrongdoing and the principle of normative competence can explain why the addict is not morally accountable. Because the, because the principle of wrongdoing can't explain it because we are assuming that the addict does something wrong. He has a moral obligation to return the book. He knows that, but he doesn't do it. So the only thing that could explain why the addict is not, not morally responsible is the principle of normative competence. We would have to say that the, that the agent didn't have the ability to appreciate reasons and act on them. So it's built, in the, it's built into the principle of normative competence that the agent needs the ability to do otherwise, understanding abilities in Franklin's sense. But Franklin argues 
that it's implausible that the agent lacks the ability to do otherwise. And that's because Franklin thinks that a mere desire to do A doesn't take away from you the ability to do B. So Franklin thinks if we only have these two, these two principles here, we can no longer explain why addicts are not morally accountable. So the only abilities view, the kind of view that Farah and Viveline hold, has to say that addicts lack the ability to do otherwise. But Franklin finds this implausible, and that's because he finds it implausible that a mere desire can take away an ability from you. And he does that in the following passage. So Franklin thinks a mere desire cannot take away from you an ability, and the reason is that if your abilities change depending on what desires you have, then your abilities would widely fluctuate. You would have an ability at one point when you didn't desire anything else, and then you would lose it at another point once you've developed a desire to do something else. But there are two things to note here. The first thing to note is that the person who thinks that the addict lacks the ability to do otherwise because he has an irresistible desire to take the drug, <clears throat> saying that this person lacks the ability to do otherwise doesn't commit you to the view that desires in general take away abilities from you. After all, the addict is a special case because his desire is irresistible. That's a stipulation that Franklin makes about addiction. So then Franklin's main argument against thinking that an irresistible desire can take away from you an ability to do otherwise is this idea that abilities can wildly fluctuate. So abilities cannot just come and go away all the time. But I think Franklin is just wrong about that. Our ordinary notion of abilities does allow that abilities change all the time. And so I'm trying to give you two counterexamples about this. So suppose here's me and in the morning I'm full of self-confidence and I perform this graceful dance. So in the morning I'm able to dance gracefully and I successfully exercise that ability. But then later on someone tells me that I look, I look like a complete fool whenever I dance and that completely shatters my self-confidence and now believing that I look ridiculous whenever I dance, I try to dance again um, at lunch and I feel miserable. It doesn't look graceful again. I no longer have the ability to dance gracefully because I now believe that I look like a fool and that undermines my self-confidence. So I've lost the ability. But then later on in the afternoon, I talk to someone who tells me, oh, you looked so graceful when you danced this morning and now my self-confidence restored. I, in the evening, perform another graceful dance. I'm not able to dance gracefully again. And it strikes me as extremely, as extremely natural to say that in the morning I have the ability to dance gracefully, I lose it later when my self-confidence is shattered, and then I get it back in the afternoon when my self-confidence has recovered. So my abilities do fluctuate. And it strikes me as extremely awkward to explain this situation in the way Franklin Wood is saying that, oh, when your self-confidence shatters, you lose the opportunity to dance gracefully, but you still have the ability to do it. That just doesn't seem natural to me. So I just think Franklin is wrong. Abilities can wildly fluctuate. And I want to give you a second example that's perhaps even clearer than the dance example. Suppose there's a safe I want to open in, and suppose in the morning I know what the combination is, so I have the ability to open it. Later that day, I forget the combination, so I no longer have the ability to open it. But then in the evening, I remember the combination again, and so I regain the ability to open the safe. Again, it strikes me as completely natural to say that I have the ability, I lose the ability, I regain the ability. But it strikes me as very unnatural to say, as Franklin would, that throughout the entire day, I always have the ability to open the safe. It's just First I have the opportunity, then I lose the opportunity, and then I have the opportunity again. In summary, I think someone who wants to reject the no opportunity argument could reject the principle of reasonable opportunity by saying that we can account for a practice of holding people morally responsible just in terms of the principle of wrongdoing and the principle of normative competence. 
And that's in fact what people like Michael Ferrer in the literature did. And in fact, I gave you the article about Michael Ferrer, so you can read it if you want to. At least I think that Franklin has given no decisive argument to show that that kind of view fails. Okay, so that was the first possible um, reply to the no opportunity argument. So now I come to a second um, reply, which I call the too few opportunities argument. And let me just warn you that this is not a re reply that you find anywhere in the literature. It's a reply that I try to defend in a paper manuscript that hasn't been published. So I'm extremely interested in what you think about that, um, about that strategy. So let's briefly review Franklin's notion of an opportunity. So according to Franklin, you have the opportunity to play the piano if there's a possible world where you play the piano and that is exactly like the actual world in all respects except once, except for, your, for you playing the piano and facts that depend on you playing the piano. So that's his definition of an opportunity. And then it's also important to note that Franklin wants an opportunity argument to show that free will is incompatible with determinism, but he wants to allow that free will is compatible with indeterminism. After all, Franklin wants to be a libertarian about free will, so he thinks that we in fact do have free will because the world is indeterministic. So that's another background fact we should keep in mind. And now we can go to the objection to Franklin's argument, and the objection is that Franklin's argument proves too much. So the argument is supposed to show that determinism is incompatible with free will. But I argue that the argument would show much, much more. It would show that we, nobody ever has free will for reasons that have nothing to do with determinism. So the argument proves much, much more than it's supposed to show. And why is that? So here's the actual world. And suppose in the actual world, I stand next to a piano, but I don't decide to play the piano. So I don't decide to play piano, and so I don't play piano. And now it's an um, interesting question. Did I have the opportunity to decide to play the piano? So I'm focusing on decisions here instead of actions, because it will make my argument a bit easier, but I don't think much hinges on that. So I decide to not play the piano. Did I have the opportunity to decide to play the piano? So for Franklin, for me to have the opportunity to play the piano, there must be a possible world that's exactly like the actual circumstances, except for my decision to play the piano and facts that depend on me playing the piano. But I argue that there is no such possible world. And the reason is that human decisions are grounded in fundamental physical facts. So every decision I make is grounded in a more fundamental fact, namely, my brain being in a certain microphysical configurations. So human decisions are grounded in fundamental physical facts. And so here's the microphysical state my decision to play the piano would be grounded in were I to make it. And so in every, in every possible world where I decide to play the piano, some microphysical state has to occur that grounds my playing the piano. And such a microphysical state doesn't occur in the actual world because in the actual world, I don't decide to play the piano. But my decision is not identical to that microphysical state. That's something philosophers have argued for a long time due to what is called the argument for multiple realizability. So if my decision were identical to this microphysical state, then the two would always have to go together. But people have long thought that the very one and the same decision could be realized by more than one different microphysical states. So this state here cannot be identical to the decision because the decision could, be, could occur without this particular state. But it's still true that for my decision to occur, there must be some microphysical state that realizes it because human decisions are not free floating. But then the crucial point is that this microphysical state here doesn't depend on my decision. It's the other way around. My decision doesn't explain why this microphysical state here occurs. It's the other way around. This microphysical state here explains why my decision occurs. It grounds my decision. But then it follows that every possible world in which, con contrary to what I do in the actual world, I decide to play the piano, some fact must occur that doesn't occur in the actual world, but that also doesn't depend on my decision, namely some microphysical state that realizes the decision that I don't make in the actual world. But then it follows according to Franklin's own account of an opportunity, 
that no one has ever the opportunity to do otherwise. And it follows for reasons that have nothing to do with determinism. So even though Franklin's argument then would show that no one can ever do otherwise and no one ever has free will, it doesn't show that this obtains because of determinism. The same problem would arise in an indeterministic world. And that seems to show that Franklin's condition of an opportunity is too strong. This requirement here, everything except the action and events that depend on the actions are the same as in the actual world, puts two strong requirements on what it takes for an agent to do otherwise. It puts requirements on doing otherwise that would entail that we lack free will for reasons that have nothing to do with determinism. And if that is right, then we are well, then we are justified in rejecting opportunity and so rejecting the no opportunity argument. Okay, that was the second reply to Franklin's argument. The third reply is a bit more general. So here I'm outlining um, a way of rejecting fixity of the past. So Franklin makes a seemingly incredible plausible assumption that our actions do not, that the past, the distant past or the past in general, it doesn't depend on our present actions. And that's justified by the direction of causation. So the past is not the way it is because of our actions, because intuitively our actions do not cause the past. And intuitively, that seems like an extremely plausible assumption, but I want to do a little bit to motivate that it's actually more controversial than Franklin makes it sound. And that has to do with facts about fundamental physics. So fundamental physics tries to provide a comprehensive description of reality, and it does so by using two things. It uses a physical state, and that's what the state of the world is like at any given time, and it uses laws of temporal evolution that describe how the physical state evolves over time. So the laws of temporal evolution um, constrain how a physical state of the world at one time um, leads to a state of the world at a different time. And the important fact is what shape these laws of temporal evolution takes. And in fact, an interesting fact is that many of our best candidates for the fundamental physical laws are time symmetric. These laws have the exact same character in both temporal direction. For example, many candidates for the fundamental physical laws, such as the Newtonian laws or the Schrodinger equation and quantum mechanics, are deterministic in both temporal directions, so be deterministic. And that means that the complete state of the world at any given time determines both a unique past and a unique future. So there's no asymmetry in these laws. But many people think that laws and causation are closely related. After all, the fundamental laws have to do with how a state at one time leads to a state at a different time. But causation also concerns how a state at one time leads to a state at another time. And so there's a challenge of how to make our ordinary concept of causation, which is time symmetric, such that earlier states cause later states, but not vice versa, compatible with the fundamental physical laws, which are such that the past determines the future, but the future also determines the past in accordance with these laws. And so there's the following challenge, which has been much discussed in the philosophy of physics. How is our ordinary time asymmetric concept of causation compatible with the time symmetry of the fundamental physical laws? And I just want to give you one answer to that question, which is due to Bertrand Russell. And I just want to give it to you because it's one of the coolest passages in all of philosophy. And Bertrand Russell thinks that these tensions, among other things, just shows that our ordinary concept of causation is complete nonsense, and we should no longer talk about causation because it's totally out of touch with how physics reveals to us the world actually is. Okay, so I'll give you a few seconds to appreciate the quote. It's always nice if you can um, if you can put some polemic social commentary into your metaphysical claims. Okay, but so more contemporary, most people think that the concept of causation is really important. Lots of sciences other than physics use causation. In everyday life, we need a notion of causation. We shouldn't get rid of the concept of causation. But these people think that our ordinary concept of causation doesn't really reflect how the world fundamentally is. 
we ordinarily think that causation is time asymmetric, but strictly speaking, causation goes in both temporal directions, or at least it's not strictly time asymmetric, such that there's a sense in which our current decisions do influence the past. And that's what all of these people say here in these quotes. And these are respectable philosophers of physics. And it's important to note that none of these people thinks that, oh, you should now start making it the case that you were rich as a child, or you should now try to make it the case that you wore something different yesterday than you in fact wore. So these people think it would still be irrational to try to affect what happened in the past, but they think this has to do something with our makeup as agent. So we are, <clears throat> so I think if when God looks down on the world, she doesn't see any time asymmetric causation. When God looks at the world, she thinks that the past and future are in important respects on par. But we are not like God. We don't look at the world from outside. We are embedded in the world and everything about us is time asymmetric. Our brains work time asymmetric. We're embedded in a world where things are distributed asymmetrical. And that explains why we, can't, why we don't have any control over the past, even though the fundamental principles that govern our universe are time symmetric. And I haven't given you all the details, but the little bit I gave you at least hopefully make you appreciate that there's some wiggle room for trying to reject this premise here, fixity of the past. But you have to keep in mind that if you go this way, you really have your work cut out for you. So it's easy to claim that causation at the fundamental, fundamental level is time symmetric. But if you actually make that claim, you still have a whole lot of explanatory work to do of how to reconcile this fundamental time, this fundamental time symmetry with all the asymmetries we experience in everyday life. And why does it make sense in everyday life to have a time asymmetric notion of causation? So you still have a lot of explanatory work to do. And that's why this here is not a popular strategy, because it seems so speculative. If the only reason you can somehow explain how free will is compatible with determinism is by having to say these controversial things about causation. It doesn't seem very satisfying. But it's a, an option that's out there, and I think it's much more plausible than what Franklin gives it credit for. Okay, so these are three options I've given you of how you could reject Franklin's argument. If you have other options, I'm very interested to hear them, and I'm extremely interested in hearing from you what you think about these replies which do you think is the strongest? Which do you think might work? Which do you think might not work? And so I'll talk to you soon.